Hey everyone, so I want to start off this video with this theorem, that the square root of 2 is irrational. This is a very classic theorem for uh, students who are new to proving things, uh, are often faced with, and for very good reason, which hopefully you'll see by the end of this video. So if we're trying to prove that the square root of 2 is irrational, well, we need to figure out a few things first. So I'll start doing some scratch. First, what we need to figure out is what does it mean for a number to be irrational? What checkboxes do we sort of have to check off in order to show that the square root of 2 is irrational? Well, we know that an irrational number, this is the only definition we have for an irrational number, by the way, but an irrational number is a real number that is not rational. And remember, we went through the exercise of showing that we can define the set of all irrational numbers using the real numbers minus the rational numbers, like so. But this isn't really good enough. Because then we have to figure out, okay, well, I mean, it's easy to show that it's a real number because the square root of 2 is not imaginary whatsoever. But how do we figure out that it's not rational? Well, we can look at the definition of rational number. So a rational number can be expressed as n over m where n and m are integers, m is not equal to 0, and where n and m have no common factors. So in order to show that the square root of 2 is irrational, we have to show that this whole thing fails for the square root of 2 so that either so that it's impossible to express the square root of 2 as a number n over m so either one of n or m cannot be integers or m has to be equal to 0 this one we know is really easy it's basically given to us so you can't have a fraction divided by 0 or you have to have that fraction uh, n and m such that they have common factors of some sort. But this is really hard to say because you have to show that this is impossible for all possible infinite combinations of integers. So you have an infinite number of choices for n and an infinite number of choices of m, even excluding the fact that m, or even including that n, m cannot be zero. But like, this is feasibly impossible for us to do. It's really hard for us to show that something is impossible it's much easier to show us to show that something is possible, at least when we're talking about using a direct proof or a proof by contraposition. In addition, we, it's really hard for us to apply a direct proof here because this isn't a uh, if then statement. This isn't a conditional whatsoever. So how do we go about this? Well, that's what the that's what the point of this video is today is this is a proof. What we're going to do is we're going to basically figure out a proof of impossibility. If what we're going to basically work out is we're going to say, hey, let's assume that the incorrect thing is actually true. And the nice thing about that is at some point that's going to contradict something mathematically. Because the thing with our, say, with our set of uh, mathematical rules, we've so precisely defined them in a way that basically... If you add anything else to that uh, to those uh, set of fundamental rules that just doesn't work with any of the fundamental rules, at some point you get some sort of contradiction. So that's what we're shooting for here, is we're going to say, well, let's suppose this theorem is actually false. Let's suppose that the square root of 2 is actually rational. And then what we'll, f what we'll see is that we'll come across to something that's basically impossible, something something won't work out right. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. The first thing I want to notice is, let's say we have some proposition P that is true and false, like so. 
What I also want to look at is not P, which of course is false, then true. Now what I want to do is look at the column that is just false. So that will just be false and false no matter what. So if we look at not P implies false. What we'll see is that this uh, false and false is true and true and false is false. So what is sort of going on here is that when P is a true statement and we assume not P and then try to prove that by assuming not P we get to some sort of false statement, then we get basically this gives us an equivalent statement. So it, it, it is enough to show that P is true by assuming not P is true, but then showing that that leads to some kind of contradiction right there. And the same thing goes the other way around. If P is false and not P is true, then assuming not P and going to false is false. So actually, if P is a false statement and not P ends up being a true statement, then what this is trying to say is that this argument won't work out very well. That's a little bit complicated, so I hope I can explain how we're going to take advantage of finding some sort of false, sort of self-contradicting fact in uh, when, when we actually go through the proof about this. But what we're going to do, what we're doing is known as a proof by contradiction. We're going to do a proof by contradiction of the statement P. So when we're doing a proof by contradiction of the statement P, what we're going to do is we're going to first, we'll assume not P. So this is our assumption along with all of the fundamental rules that we're used to in mathematics and the definitions that we've learned so far. And actually what we end up doing is the same thing as a direct proof. So again, we're following logic in the same way as a direct proof. We're applying theorems that we already know are true, definitions, our fundamental axioms, and so on. And eventually reach a contradiction. This will usually be a statement that logically follows from the assumption of not P along with our applications of theorems and definitions and stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a statement that logically follows from our assumptions, but also doesn't agree with something like one of our definitions or some axiom or something like that. So it's a self-contradicting statement of some sort. And then what we'll do is we'll then say, therefore, by proof by contradiction, P is true. What we're saying is basically, since we've assumed not P and we found some sort of logical contradiction, well, the only possible way for, the, the only possible outcome is that P must be true because otherwise if P is false, you get that logical contradiction. So let's take a look at what a proof by contradiction looks like for this theorem. Okay, so what I have here is a lemma. And you might remember from the uh, introduction to propositions video that a lemma, or sorry, from the introduction to proofs video, that a lemma is a theorem that we prove in order to help prove the main theorem we're interested in. So we are interested in this theorem that the square root of two is irrational. And I'm using, I'm going to use this theorem at some point in order to show that the main theorem is true. So uh, the, this, uh, and the reason why I know that we need this lemma is just through experience. Likely what would happen is you'd be proving the main theorem before and then come up across something you're like, oh, well shoot, maybe I should prove that whole thing first, cite that as a lemma and then continue on my proof assuming that we have that as a lemma. So basically because I'm very familiar with this proof, I know that we need this lemma right here. So basically we're letting a be an integer and we're saying that if a squared is even, then a is even. And this is really contingent on the fact that a is an integer. 
because you can have a, some even number where the square root of that is not a perfect square, or sorry, where that number is not a perfect square, so the square root of that is not an integer, but we're saying specifically that an even integer squared is even, or rather that if you take the square root of a perfect square that happens to be even, then the result of that is even. So what we're doing is a simple proof at contraposition, and because we covered that in the last video, I'm not going to go super in-depth in this, but we're supposing that a is odd, which is the start of our proof by contraposition. Uh, we'll let two, a equals 2k plus 1 for some integer k by definition of odd. Then I'm just substituting in for a squared, so that's equal to 2k plus 1 squared, which is 4k squared plus 4k plus 1, which is then 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. Uh, we do the whole um, setting L equal to this and showing that L is an integer, so then a squared equals 2L plus 1. So a, a squared is odd, which is not P, which is where we're trying to go in our proof by contraposition. Therefore, if a squared is even, then a is even. So that's a brief explanation of the lemma. We will be using this when we talk about the main theorem. All right, so here's the theorem again, that the square root of 2 is irrational. And we're going to do a proof by contradic contradiction. So I'll write that down on the side. Proof contradiction. And we'll start by assuming the negation of the theorem, which is that if the square root of 2 is irrational, is the theorem, then that means that the square root of 2 is not rational. So then our uh, negation of the theorem will just be that the square root of 2 is is rational. So we'll say, suppose seeking a contradiction that the square root of 2 is rational. And immediately, we can start applying the definition of rational here, because that is our that is what we're supposing is that the square root of two is rational. So we'll say that then the square root of two equals a over b, where a and b are integers, b is not equal to zero, and a and b have no common factors. So this is where we're going to start. We will, we will look at, basically we're just going to take this equation and start playing with it. So if the square root of two equals a divided by b, well, that means that b times the square root of two equals a, right? And then we can square both sides to get rid of this nasty square root because it's hard for us to do things with the square root of two. So we can say that b squared times 2 equals a squared, or that a squared equals 2 times b squared. Now, we know that b squared is an integer because b is also an integer. So this gives us that a squared is equal to 2 times some integer, so a squared is an even number. Now, this is why this is why I proved this lemma right here, that if a squared is even, then a is even. Well, we can apply that right here. So we can say, by the lemma, this means a is even. Let a equal 2k for some k in the integers by definition. So then what we have is that, well, if a equals 2k, then well, we'll, I'll write down a squared equals 2b squared again. This means that 2k squared equals 2b squared. So then 4 k squared equals 2b squared, which means that uh, 2k squared equals 
be squared like so. And again, we have that since k is an integer, k squared is also an integer. So b squared is equal to 2 times some integer. We can apply the definition of even again. So now what we'll do is we'll say uh, by the lemma, this means b is even. We'll let b equal 2 times j. Note that I'm using a j and not a k this time because they're completely different numbers here. So we'll let b equal 2j for j in the integers by definition. And already you should see the contradiction right here. Um, basically what's going on is that we have a is even and b is even. So now a equals 2 times k and b equals 2 times j. So both a and b are actually divisible by 2. So we'll write that down. Then a and b are both divisible by 2. The problem is that we defined a and b using the definition of rational numbers. We said that the square root of 2 is rational so that a over b have to follow all the restrictions here, which includes that a and b must have no common factors. So what we have is that a and b simultaneously have no common factors, but at the same time, they are both divisible by 2. So they both have at least one common factor. And that is the contradiction we're going for. We have our self-contradicting statement right there. So what we'll do is we'll draw a symbol. And uh, this depends, you know, this is sort of like the QED, where you can really draw whatever you want here. Uh, this time we'll do an angry symbol or a sad symbol or something like that. So what I normally do is something like this where it's two arrows facing each other. Uh, sometimes you could also do something like that, which is the uh, the lightning of Zeus striking down upon your proof because he is, uh, I don't know, angry at you for making a contradiction. You could do a frowny face, maybe a frowny face with a little tear coming out of it because it's sad that you, uh, that you found a contradiction, stuff like that. But something along you know, something angry, something sad, something like that. And what we'll do after we've pointed out that there's a contradiction symbolically is we'll explain why there's a contradiction. So we'll say this contradicts the definition of rational numbers. Which states that A and B must have no common factors. So now that we've explained the, the contradiction, now that we know that it's there, we can finish this up by saying, therefore, by proof, by contradiction, The square root of 2, basically the square root of 2 cannot be rational, so the square root of 2 is irrational. And I'll be honest with y'all, I really enjoy this proof a lot. It's such a cool one. You really get to play with math a lot, and, you know, just something about the first proof by contradiction is really special. So I hope y'all enjoyed this one a lot. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in this video is... What do you do if you're trying to do a proof by contradiction of a if p then q statement? Because when I was talking about a uh, actual proof by contradiction sort of structure, what I did was I just talked about any sort of p, but if p happens to be equivalent to a, con a uh, conditional statement, then we need to figure out what to do. So what I have here is a very long truth table, but basically what I have is the negation right here of if p then q. So the, neg so the negation of that is going to have to be our assumption. 
we're going to take the negation of that and then find a contradiction here. Well, I think this was, I believe this was an exercise in um, either in the videos or the homework, something like that. But I'm pretty sure we talked about this exercise before. But we showed that the negation of if P then Q is equivalent to P and not Q. So what this means is that P and not Q, if you assume this, then this is a valid assumption for a proof by contradiction of if P then Q. And to really demonstrate that, what I have is the truth table of P and not Q, all of that implying false. So if you have this statement where P and not Q implies false, what this means is when you assume P and not Q and get to a logical contradiction, that's going to be the same thing as proving if P then not Q. So that's what you do when you, um, when you are trying to prove a if P then Q statement by contradiction is you assume P and not Q, and then you try to find the contradiction in there. So we had a previous theorem that was let N be an integer if 3N plus 2 is odd, then N is odd. Something like that. This was in the proof by contrapositive video. If you're trying to do a proof by contradiction on this, then what you'll end up doing is you will say, so P is 3N plus 2 is odd, Q is N is even, so not Q is N, oh sorry, Q is N is odd, not Q is N is even. So if you're trying to prove this, the first thing you would start out with is let n be an integer. Suppose 3n plus 2 is odd and seeking a contradiction. That n is even. Now what I'll do is I will let you all try this on your own and see see sort of how this compares to a proof by contra position. But what I'll say is that sometimes there are proofs where a proof by contradiction and a proof by contra position look very similar, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily interchangeable. For a lot of proofs, proof by contradiction like for this one, for example, proof of contradiction makes it a lot easier to really work out the problem because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, let's suppose otherwise. Let's suppose that this theorem is not true. Then how can we show that there's uh, something, some sort of impossibility here? Now, an example I know that we did do a lot was the statement, uh, there exists an X such that for all Y x is less than y. Something like this. And what we did to show this is like, we were saying, I think I had a discussion of, well, if this was true, then that means there, that would imply that there is a lowest x and something like that. So what you can also do if you want a fun example is use a proof by contradiction to try to show that this is true. So basically the theorem would be there exists an X such that for all integer, actually, I think it was real numbers, wasn't it? Real numbers Y, X is less than Y. And then you would say, suppose, basically, uh, what you actually, what you would try to show with the theorem is that there does not exist such an X. So there exists no x such that for all real numbers y, x is less than y. Then you would say, suppose seeking a contradiction, that there is a real number x such that for all real numbers 
y, x is less than y. And this is this would also be another good exercise to try proving by yourself. But basically, when you're working with a proof by contradiction, sometimes the trickiest part is figuring out the contradiction, you know, figuring out the right examples, and then trying to find the contradiction. So my my advice is sort of like with a direct proof, you want to just uh, try to apply all the definitions that you know and you know try to see try to keep in mind like all the assumptions that you're making and eventually try to find that contradiction. So it takes practice, but you know that's why we're doing this class. All right, well, thank you all for watching.